Dear Excellencies, dear colleagues, dear ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome you today. The last two days we enjoyed plenty of sp inspiring speeches and motivating discussions. In the following session, we invite you to meet German good practices and offer you a glimpse of how ESD is implemented on the ground. When we started planning this World Conference, we were excited to welcome you all in Berlin. To have a dynamic part in the program, we planned field trips to local ESD practitioners. We wanted to give you a chance to get to know and experience the local ESD community yourself. That is why we called, why we called upon our local ESD stakeholders to open their doors and share their work and experiences with you. Unfortunately, the pandemic does not allow us to physically travel yet, but coming together digitally allows us to offer you an even wider variety of actors across Germany in this session. I'm pleased to invite you to go on a virtual journey and meet one of the 15 hosts from different fields. You will find ESD in action in formal as well as in informal educational settings, at schools and universities, as well as museums and early childhood educators. Some of the hosts are part of the UNESCO family. You will find inspiring examples of UNESCO networks presenting how they implement ESD in their day-to-day -day work. You will find insights on how ESD can be a motor for gender equality and empower young people to change the world and much more. What connects all of these projects and stakeholders is a great passion and energy for putting ESD into practice. We hope that you can use this opportunity to change on the topics that are most relevant to you directly with the stakeholders right now. We are convinced that you can use this opportunity to learn from each other and be inspired. Together we can strengthen our messages around ESD. I want to use this opportunity to thank the UNESCO and the Federal Ministry of Education and Research for a trusting partnership. We are grateful to support this World Conference as an important milestone for ESD for 2030. At the German Commission for UNESCO, we remain committed to promote ESD and spread ESD through our strong network, part of which you will get to know right now. We will continue to strengthen the existing partnerships and explore new synergies. We strongly believe that ESD is the key for a more sustainable and just world. Our mandate is clear. We need to further reinforce our collected efforts to put ESD for 2030 in practice. I wish you all a very fruitful discussions and hope you will be able to come to Germany very soon to share your experience with us in person. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Böhmer, President of the UNESCO uh, Commission here in Germany. Uh, Madam Minister, dear panelists, participants uh, of the UNESCO conference, uh, dear friends, uh, first of all, a very good afternoon to you all and a warm welcome to this studio in the Nordic embassies here in Berlin. My name is Per Torreson. I'm the Swedish ambassador to Germany since uh, four years. Uh, and for me and for us, it's a great honor to host this event together with our partners, Institute Futur in Berlin, the German youth organization, UPAN, and Swede ESD at Uppsala University. And we're going to spend the next hour or so discussing synergies between education for sustainable development and gender equality. 
And the event is, of course, in connection with the ongoing UNESCO World Conference on Education for Sustainable Development. A warm thanks also to our partners and to the Federal Ministry of Education and Research for giving us the opportunity to host this event. We will deal with two sustainable development goals uh, today. They are both central for the implementation of Agenda 2030, both goals in themselves, but also key to achieving all the sustainable development goals of the Agenda. And I'm of course talking about SDG 4 on education and SDG 5 on gender equality. Today's event also happens to match two of the top priorities that we are working with at the Swedish Embassy in Berlin. And I don't think I need to point that out, but the first one being gender equality, where we are proud to represent the world's first feminist government uh, pursuing a feminist foreign policy. Uh, but also Agenda 2030 and the 17 SDGs, where we would like to stimulate an exchange uh, of between Sweden and Germany on best practices. Uh, for instance, we have developed an exhibition on Sweden and the Agenda 2030. Uh, this exhibition can currently be seen at the Steinplatz here in central Berlin. And the plan is really to go on tour with this exhibition to all the Bundesländer, we hope. With those few words, it is now my honor and pleasure to hand over this digital floor uh, for a keynote statement by Matilda Ankrans, Minister for Higher Education and Research uh, in Sweden. Uh, Madam Minister, the digital floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Thank you very much. It's an honor to have the opportunity to introduce this discussion on topics so important for me, for, for all of us. Full human rights is a fundamental part of a sustainable society. The past year has been extremely difficult and to many young people on a global level, uh, they have been hit uh, by closed schools or distant learning, leisure activities being closed and too much of involuntary loneliness. About 260 million children and young people uh, were estimated to not attend school before the pandemic, and this number has now increased massively. These effects on a global level are gendered. Uh, the risk of gender-based violence has increased during the pandemic. The share of unpaid work carried out by girls and women has increased which means that they have less time to study. And girls are increasingly, uh, forced, increasingly forced out of school for economic reasons. 11 million girls who had started school before the pandemic may never return when schools open up. After the pandemic, we need to have a strong focus on good quality education and gender equality to combat this injustice. This is how we can give girls and women better prospect, prospects. Gender equality builds stronger and more resilient societies for all. At a world conference such as the UNESCO one, uh, it is important to, be, to, to dare to be visionary, but it is just as important to remind ourselves what we have already committed to, namely the 2030 agenda, especially goal four, quality education for all, and goal five when it comes to gender equality. Uh, we have the target when it comes to uh, quality of education that stipulates that all learners must acquire, must acquire knowledge and skills to promote a sustainable development, including human rights and gender equality. We need to teach crit critical thinking, a strong sense of initiative and the ability to understand complex challenges from climate change, loss of biodiversity to gender inequality. Education for a sustainable development must actively promote critical perspective on norms that define gender ways of being and living together. This includes, includes comprehensive sexuality education 
and ensuring that members of the LGBTQ community fully enjoy their human rights. In that way, education can promote the tools to form a better world. We need education for sustainable development. Education must also be inclusive. Much remains to be done in this area. Two thirds of the adults who are not able to read are women. According to recent data from UNESCO, only 2% of the poorest rural females in low income countries com complete upper secondary school. The long term effects are, of course, severe. Lesser access to education means fewer options to the job market. And of course, the personal and transformative benefits of access to education are cut short. Gender inequalities are also present within the education system. In Sweden, a country well known for when it comes to gender equality, we still have more to do. For instance, one of the largest groups during Me Too in Sweden were women within the academic sector. Many shocking stories emerge about women exposed to sexual harassment during the Me Too movement from all parts of society, including academia. To know that some women might leave leaving an education or a research career because of this is simply unacceptable. The education sector has, has a responsibility to stop all harassment, but also to counteract traditional gender patterns. It should promote pupils and students to explore and develop their abilities and dreams interests independently of gender affiliation. According to a, uh, to a report from UNESCO in 2017, only 35% of students in science, technology, engineering and mathematics globally are women. And we can see this pattern in Sweden as well. These numbers show that we are not talking about a single country's challenge, but rather a global challenge. When it comes to gender equality, education is key. But nevertheless, we need to fight gender inequalities also within education. But it is through edu the education system that we can break up and destroy these patterns. That is why gender equality is so important to bring on when we talk about transformative education for a sustainable society. As I said before, it is important to dare to be visionary, but we should not just imagine the world of tomorrow. We should also need, we also need to act on how we can achieve it today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Matilda Ankrans, Minister of Higher Education and Research in Sweden. And many thanks also to all former speakers. I am Eva Freeman, and I'm super happy to be here and take part of this event. I'm very honored to moderate the rest of this afternoon. <clears throat> uh, being a researcher and director of Swedes at Uppsala University, the Sustainability Learning and Research Center at Uppsala University. Um, and this Sw Swedes was inaugurated actually as Sw Sweden's contribution to the UN decade of ESD. And later it was also the Swedish government's ESD coordinator and UNESCO key partner during the Global Action Programme, as well as co-chair for Action Area 3. Um, among my research interests, and certainly at, at the core of SWEDES, is ESD, social learning and co-creation of knowledge, and transformative learning for equality, equity and sustainability. So this is really close to my heart, both as a person, as a researcher, and, and of course as a university centre director then. Uh, that's me, and I want to welcome our distinguished panelists. Uh, I will shortly present you now so you know, and ask you to add anything that you might find important when asking you the first question. Here we have our panelists. First is Antje Bruck at Institut Futur Freie Universität in Berlin, who is researching ESD and ESD monitoring in Germany. She can provide us here with a meso and micro perspective on science and educational practice. Anche is present at the auditorium, as you see, and you're very welcome, Anche. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Nicolas Klassen, uh, our second pa panelist, 
at uh, what was already mentioned at the German youth organization, UPA. Uh, and you're working with uh, changing education, really, uh, among other things. Nic Nicholas can add a micro perspective on education practice and youth engagement to this discussion. And uh, he's also present in the auditorium. So uh, warm welcome, Nicholas. Thank you for having me. Uh, thirdly, Maki Hayashikawa, uh, Director of the Division of Education 2030 Support and Coordination at UNESCO, and who can provide us with an international mi micro policy perspective here. And Maki, you're present in Paris. Warmly welcome. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Thank you. Before uh, starting to uh, uh, question, uh, give you questions, I of course also want to direct a warm welcome to all our participants. We are very many here, which makes a common discussion a bit tricky. However, we of course want you to really take part in this event, <clears throat> and we are super interested in your experiences and knowledge. So during the rest of this event, I will call upon you, if we have time, which I really hope, uh, three times to share your views and thoughts, starting now. Um, would you please, yes, um, before the question, maybe we should have the, the QR code. There are three, uh, yes, thank you. There are three ways to come into a Mentimeter uh, questionnaire. With this QR code, um, you can also go to www.menti.com and use a code 26227978. And please see the chat, it's in there. Or you can also use a direct link, I think. Yes, that's also in the chat. Uh, and uh, this time we wanted to answer two questions. Firstly, which gender do you identify with? And secondly, have you personally experienced gender-related inequalities or discrimination? I will wait a few seconds more before commenting. This might not have to be commented on either, this question. Mostly female, we can see, um, about double the, the amount of males, and so far no other uh, gender um, here. Yes, let's uh, see the answer to the next one. Here is a question about whether you uh, have or have, well, whether you have been um, experiencing gender related inequalities and discrimination. And um, first, you can answer yes, I have occasionally experienced that. Uh, and the second uh, um, is yes, I frequently experienced that. And then no, and then um, rather I exper have experienced benefits. And so far, no answers on the last one. Luckily, the no uh, um, is leading now. So the, and that's very positive to see. And some benefits are also there. Yes. So maybe we should move on then to uh, some introductory questions. Now we at least know the, what, uh, the experience of us here today, more or less, uh, even though not everyone had the time to fill it in uh, yet. Uh, okay, so I have some introductory questions to all three panelists. And um, after adding to my introduction of yourselves, which, which was really short, if you like, um, uh, then I invite you to share a personal experience that touches gender or gender in education with us. And also at the same time, uh, to share with us what makes you personally 
engaged in working with uh, or promoting gender equality. Let's start with Antje, then Nicolas, and then Maki. Antje, please. Thank you, Eva. So um, I think my view on gender equality um, has been shaped by the fact that I was born in the former GDR, Eastern Germany. And I was, I think, born late enough not to be influenced by the ideology too much, but early enough to um, realize uh, certain things from uh, or being shaped by the mentality, by the structures, uh, the infrastru uh, infrastructure and um, the social structure. And I think that um, things we are struggling for today have been taken for granted back then, certain things. I'm talking here about um, early childhood education for everyone in a high quality. I'm talking about um, being a physicist as a, as a woman, being a, uh, um, let's uh, look at Mrs. Merkel or being a engineer, and that's, uh, that's not even worth mentioning. So there was no need of a, of a girl's day or something like that. And that was one side of the coin of uh, some idea of equality in that society. The other side of the coin, we should not forget to mention that, is that there was also a sheer uh, economic necessity to involve women in, in the um, process uh, of and, and in, in working processes. So therefore, there might have been ambivalent uh, motivations to do that, but there were really good solutions. And what I want to emphasize is that uh, I think earlier and later history is full of good solutions, uh, no matter the ambivalence of the original original motivations to implement that. So I think I want to encourage us to look for these solutions and to collect them because they are there. Great, thank you, Ante. <coughs> Very interesting to hear that. And it's a quite, for me, unusual experience, but super nice. Thank you. Uh, Nicolas, please. Um, yes, I, um, my perspective maybe on gender inequality is that I myself am a law student. And uh, in my university life, that's still is uh, something very present. Uh, in preparation for this event, I've, I've looked up on, on our website, we have our faculty has 18 professors and four of them are women, which still is a good percentage, which is around 20% percentage and the average percent um, of female law professors in Germany is 12%. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we can see, uh, especially in some, um, areas that have been traditionally also very dominated by men, uh, we still have a big lack of representation, which is still prevalent today. And I think we, which is, which is something we need to work at. Um, and of this, which, which is also why, why I would, I would, I, I myself am engaged for gender equality because it, it not only creates problems for and those affected by it, so um, uh, people uh, which are not male, um, but uh, also for the whole society in terms of safety, um, in terms of wealth, um, and also for men who are suffering under stereotypes, um, under uh, role models, and which, which are part of gender inequality uh, and a, a patriarchal society, which we still have in parts today. Yes. Thank you. Well, that goes a lot for Sweden too. Thank you, Nicolas, and, and many countries, of course. Maki, please. Thank you very much, Eva, and thank you very much for inviting me to this panel this afternoon. Um, I would say that my engagement uh, in this field of gender equality in education in ESD really goes back many years, but in particular, uh, through my engagement uh, as uh, the UNESCO uh, staff member, through this um, network called the Gender Inequality uh, in Education in Asia Pacific, a network for capacity building of gender focal points of ministries of education in the Asia Pacific countries. And this was actually a network formed in 2003, so all the way back to the EFA time, when countries had to kind of mainstream gender into their national EFA plans. And in order to do that, we came to realize that most ministries had actually no clue of what gender mainstream was all about at the time. And so the first point was to uh, appoint gender focal points in the Ministry of Education, train them in the whole theory and concept of gender equality, 
and to see how we can mainstream gender perspective in the education plans and to also monitor the progress accordingly. And that has been my very entry <laughs> in this field. And since then I have been engaged through the United Nations Growth Education Initiative. And also my research interest has been in also looking at the, the female domination in teaching force at the lower level, especially the early childhood. So maybe that's my entry point. And of yeah, course, it's evolving every, every, every moment. Thank you so much, Maki. Good. Okay, so let's move on then to specific questions to, to you individually, addressing your professional perspectives. And this time I want to start with Maki. So based on your experience of working with gender issues now, uh, as you have told us about, could you please share some major achievements concerning gender equality with us? Uh, and also some current key issues needed to be addressed. Yeah, thank you very much, Eva. Well, I think um, in order to give a more macro perspective or international perspective, um, first of all, I think in terms of achievement, we really cannot underestimate the major achievement made in gender equality in terms of girls' access to education. Uh, it's no joke. I mean, the gender report by the Global Education Monitoring Team shows that girls' access has much improved over the last 25 years, closing the gap in enrollment ratio globally. We can see that there's been a huge rise in, in primary and secondary education enrollment, and even women in tertiary education has tripled over the last couple of years. So that's a major achievement. Of course, girls now stand on par with, with many boys, and even some countries have overtaken boys when it comes to learning outcomes in math and reading. So, for example, the data we have through the PISA in 38 countries uh, between 2000 and 2018, girls on adv advantage has an advantage over boys. Uh, in terms of um, mathematics and, and reading. And so I guess that we could also say that the stereotypical statements we often hear about girls not being good in math is now becoming a myth. Mm -hmm. However, we have also have to be very realistic because gender disparities in terms of access and quality of learning opportunities are still very per pervasive and, and affecting many countries and especially to the disadvantage of girls and women. And despite the progress, girls are still facing the worst forms of exclusion. And of course, we cannot forget the fact that girls often are compounded of multiple layers of disadvantages. So as, as the minister also earlier mentioned, you know, girls being poor, coming in rural areas, you know, uh, are very unable to complete upper secondary education in at least 20 countries in this world still. And then we have the the subject domination, gender stereotypes in terms of subject areas and male domination still stands in some areas like the ICTs, engineering, manufacturing. And this is actually a serious uh, constraint for girls and women in order for their choice of career. Mm -hmm. And this also has very clear linkages to the fact that there are fewer female teachers specialized in STEM, uh, science and technology, engineering, math subjects in, in areas, especially at the secondary education. These are major challenges still persist in, in our world. At the same time, of course, gender disparities are not only about girls being disadvantaged, as, a, as, as I mentioned earlier, and also the minister had also mentioned, boys' disengagement from education has become a very uh, strong and you know, growing concern. I mean, the global number of out-of-school children, adolescent and youth of primary and secondary school, school age in, is higher for boys than girls today. And geographically, the trend is most manifest in Central Asia, in Latin America, the Caribbean, and even some parts of Southeast Asia today. So we also need to see that there are also emerging, you know, rapidly developing gender gaps in the area of digital literacy skills. And this has a huge implication today, in particular because of the COVID-19 pandemic, which actually just, you know, caused a huge disruption in education and also brought in this whole remote learning and digital skills requirements to continue learning today. But then with all these gender gaps in the area of digital skills literacy into the disadvantage of women and girls, this is going to have a huge rollback, you know, potential for rollback, substantial gains made on girls' education in recent years. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I mean, as the minister earlier mentioned, I mean, not only that, the projection suggests that 11 million girls in the low and lower, low and lower middle income countries are, may not return to school even after school is open. Mm -hmm. um, there is also a danger for boys uh, at risk in upper and middle, upper middle and high income countries not return to school because of COVID and because of this whole digital uh, gap emerging today. Mm. So maybe I stop here. But, but Maki, then I want to. Then I want, sorry, then I want to ask you a follow-up question. Can then UNESCO, and in that case, how, 
uh, strengthen gender transformative education in your view? Mm -hmm. Well, um, for UNESCO, of course, gender equality is our global priority for the organization. And we have very specific program areas within the education as well. Uh, we have two streams of work. Um, we, of course, we mainstream gender in all work program, but we do have a, a gender uh, equality in, in and through education program as uh, guided by our strategy, which goes up to 2025 with two main outcomes. Uh, to strengthen the education systems to be, become gender transformative, as you just clearly mentioned, and also to empower girls and women. So we have two strands because when we talk about gender equality, it is, of course, not only about girls and women, but we have to address the inequalities or disparity that happens to both the disadvantage of girls and boys in different contexts and situations. But at the same time, we know that girls and women are most disadvantaged in many cases still, and that is why we also have a more targeted approach focusing on girls and women. Now, mm -hmm. within our strategy, we are focusing on three areas, basically looking at the data issue and also in making sure that we have better legal and policy and planning frameworks, and then focusing particularly on the teaching and learning processes so that we can actually empower both not only learners, but also the teachers at the same time. Hmm. Now, when it comes to the legal policy frameworks, um, UNESCO has been mo had a, a monitoring function for this, hmm. and we have developed a, a database called the Her Atlas, where we kind of lay out the data on a legislative protection to advance girls and women's education, and we monitor that. Now, in the particular kind of context of COVID-19 response and recovery today, uh, because this has been, of course, a priority and, and, and the focus for the last year and a half, mm -hmm. we have uh, launched a gender flagship to address the gender dimensions of the COVID-19 school crisis and to safeguard progress made on gender equality in education in the recent decades. There is a, a very clear gender dimensions in the COVID-19 uh, uh, context. And I think it's very important not to kind of generalize the whole impact of COVID-19 education sector as if the impact is the same for girls and boys or any, any other gender related um, sector in this world. So among one of the efforts that we have um, undertaken is to develop and together with our partners like Malala Fund, Plan International, UNGA, UNICEF, this guide called the Building Back the Equal Girls Back to School Guide. And this guide has been kind of released together with the African Union. It has been used in Liberia's National Strategy for Girls Education. It has contributed Nepal's back to school planning so that we make sure that this, um, the girls and gender dimension will be well reflected in any school reopening plan and also when children are able to come back to school. And also we are trying to roll out this plan now in, in Lao PDR, Mali, Mauritania, Nigeria, and Pakistan in many countries so that we can make sure that we integrate the content of the, the return to school, girls back to school into the sector planning uh, with particular focus on, on girls as such. Uh, great, Maki. I wish UNESCO and all of you good luck with that, all of us, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Ante, let's turn to you. Um, <laughs> In relation then to your work uh, within the team of German-wide EC monitoring, would you please share uh, some empirical insights uh, relevant to strengthening gender, uh, gender equality? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I'm also very fascinated by what I just heard from Maki, and I think uh, the points I'd like to make relate very well to that. Uh, first of all, yeah, we are um, conducting a national monitoring here in, uh, in Germany for ESD. And well, ESD, at the heart of it, there is a justice claim and therefore um, justice cannot be achieved if um, a considerable part of the society just by belonging to some gender or not belonging to it uh, does not have um, uh, the opportunities to be uh, something or to, to have something. So therefore, um, uh, for us at the monitoring, um, gender equality is a subcategory of, uh, of um, what sustainable development is about and what human rights in the end point to. So just to make clear the relation to that. Um, we here in Germany um, did not specifically uh, uh, focus on gender equality to a large extent, but what we found out in studies, for example, in a study conducted two and a half years ago, is that um, uh, 
emotions, emotions related to sustainable development that could be, for example, anger towards how things are, are going in the world, or it could be grief, it could be, it could be that you're proud that you did something right in terms of sustainable development. Those um, uh, emotions are a little bit um, higher uh, for women. That's what they are telling us. In a, in a study with more than 3,000 people, we, we conducted that, as I said, two and a half years ago. Um, and knowledge is a little lower for women compared to um, men or to young men. Um, that's what we found out in the same study, but that could be explained by um, in which subjects uh, that is uh, sustainable development related knowledge is being conveyed. So that's the typical more natural science um, um, subjects in school, for example. Mm, something I'd like to I'd like to broaden the view a bit from Germany to more more into the world, because I think it's really remarkable that there is a, a initiative, a science-based initiative, that is ranking and listing solutions of what we have to do until 2050 in order to make emissions CO2 emissions zero. And this project called Drawdown uh, ranks them in terms of their impact they are having. And we should not be surprised, or maybe, well, we shouldn't, that from these 80 things we should do, that could be in a technical, uh, uh, but also s um, social innovations, and so on and so on, among the top 10, there are two that relate to education and to women. Um, and among the 80, it's, it's three of them. And I just want to quickly mention them. So first of all, it's, um, the, uh, it's educating girls. Because when you have a, a girl that has zero years of schooling compared to a girl that has 12 years of schooling, it amounts to three to four children on average in their lifetime that, that they will have less. So no education means more children. And I refer to that because it points to um, uh, that you have a choice for, for reproduction, for example, that it's your choice and that it's not something that just comes to you and you can't do something about it. And um, also that more educated women are, um, um, when all women um, on the planet would, or girls would be in school, that would mean until 2050, uh, 800 million uh, less inhabitants compared to how the schooling rate is at the moment. And again, it, it points to um, having autonomy and free choice of how you design your future and, and family planning. So there are important points. Um, um, first, as I said, uh, education, then family planning. And just the, the last one is um, small hole. Um, um, uh, that that farmers farmers for for smaller ground, uh, women and men compared, women have uh, less. Um, they have less. Um, financial means, they have also less other support. And therefore, when they are farming, they don't get the same from uh, the same uh, outcomes from the same par ground. But if they would be equally educated, and if they would be equally um, um, uh, financially uh, supported, then they would, according to, the, to studies that have been made, get more from the same ground compared to men, 9 to 12 uh, to 20 percent more of that. So therefore, there are several reasons to support women uh, in order to curb CO2 emissions. You can really uh, uh, measure that and you can come to the conclusion that the points I mentioned earlier, education and um, and family planning, they amount to 60 gigatons of CO2 uh, emissions curbing until 2050. That's a lot. We maybe can't imagine it, uh, what that exactly means, 50 gigatons. But just uh, as a comparison, um, uh, things like uh, solar farms, afforestation or, for, or electric vehicles have less, l less impact than that. So just to, just to mention how important that would be to do. Thank you so much, Anja. Um, then I want to turn to Nicolas. Um, my first question, I, I'll put two to you at the same time, and they are connected. Uh, what role does gender equality play within the youth panel, UPAM, uh, and the work that you are involved in? And how would educational practices and ESD maybe also, or how much more ESD would we need to ensure that UPAM 
for example, would become obsolete in the future. Uh, thank you. Um, so regarding the first question, um, gender equality <coughs> is a very important factor for us in the UPEN that uh, has several dimensions. The first is, uh, first of all, we're our members are selected by a jury um, of, of also young people. And in that jury, uh, we make sure that like um, diversity is one major crit criterion that gets people into the UPAN and uh, that regards diversity regarding the region, diversity regarding subjects, diversity uh, regarding um, in what education, what part of the education sector people are in, and of course also gender. So that's a, a important part of us. Also, we have our own representatives in the German national platform on ESD, where we, uh, where we um, also make sure that these representatives all, always are um, of different genders. So that's uh, an important point if we select these representatives. Um, and in also in different events and uh, meetings we have with different stakeholders, we also try to um, make sure that our our kind of delegation is a, in a way balanced uh, regarding genders and i think uh, that's that's something we, which we try to take care of i think there's maybe also also room for improvement there because even though uh, the upen is gender wise very uh, I think I think we are we're almost 50/50 50, 50, uh, women and men and some some other genders too. Um, uh, but if it if it comes to uh, important meetings with with uh, members of parliament or some important uh, stakeholders, it's often more men uh, that apply to these meet uh, to go to these meetings than women, um, which is something we we all. Or we try to work on. Um, to the second question, um, we, I think we as the UPEN think that a fundamental change of our education system is necessary to uh, go towards uh, education for sustainable development. We've put up our own uh, demands for that and also gender equality is a very important part of that we believe and so we believe that uh, if we have a, an education system which is kind of um, setting an example for gender equality that can reflect to our society and create this gender uh, equal society that, we, uh, society that we need and also and, and want. Um, mm. And um, if, if in, in, in this ideal scenario of us, uh, I think um, the UPEN wouldn't be obsolete because we uh, youth participation is also one of the key elements that we see as the UPAN. So um, we think um, that uh, young people, as, as the people who are getting, usually getting educated in the education system, need to be part of um, this process, of the decision-making process. And mm. uh, that's what we think as, as the UPAN is done quite well here. Um, but um, is is very very necessary um, and also in terms of uh, democratic education um, we and and political education that's very important to have student unions uh, in schools to have um student councils and that's um in fact we we probably would in our ideal scenario would even have more um youth participation bodies than uh, less yeah <laughs> Yeah, and maybe work with something that is uh, not exactly what you have to do today, but but uh, going further. Uh, super. Thank you, Nicolas. Uh, Argue for more youth participation, but we already have. It. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay, so then I would like to turn to all participants again, uh, and you can see, and we go to the Mentimeter, and you can see in the chat two ways of getting there, and maybe we can show also the. Uh, QR code again. There it is. Uh, please use that or go to the chat and use one of the two more ways to get to the Mentimeter. And this time the question is, which word or what words do, does or do, in your view, best describe the main obstacle to gender equality? And we'll show it here.
let's see if there is a delay uh, in, in answers coming up. Here we have, yeah. Patriarchy, male fragility, capitalism, education, money. Uh, old traditions, yes. Culture, religion, tradition, sexism. Mm -hmm. Then you could also add, uh, well, you could put the same question uh, also behind. Why do we have a narrow-mindedness uh, uh, conflict? Um, yeah, kind of leadership that is not um, referring or driving gender equality. I would like us to save this image. <laughs> I would like to use it many times. Thank you so much for, for your participation. Uh, I really do agree uh, on uh, most or maybe all of these. Thanks. Uh, I'll come back to you once again uh, in, a, in, a, in a while. Okay, so uh, back to the panel again. Um, I have two more questions, and this time is not uh, directed to any uh, particular one of you. you you're all um, welcome to answer and also discuss with each other. And I'll put all, both of them uh, at the same time, and then you can choose. So please listen up, panelists. Uh, first of all, having discussed the above questions from your uh, and also seen uh, the answers from the participants, uh, from your personal perspe uh, experience then, and from this that we have discussed, what really defines the status quo of gender equality and where would you like us to, to go and to end up? That's the first one. And then uh, a question that I think is perhaps hardest for, the, for an event like this, at least in my mind then, is to define and reflect on the very connections between education in general and gender equality as well as sustainable development in general, and more specifically between ESD and gender equality. As we know, education and ESD can be important factors for increased gender equality. Uh, I refer, for example, to what our uh, minister said in the beginning in her keynote. However, education does not necessarily produce individual moral or social ethics promoting gender equality or sustainable development. We know that too. Overconsumption exists in my country and in the global north at large, among the most educated people. And still, women die from domestic violence in my country, even though we have the most, but we have a feminist government, feminist uh, um, uh, politics, and so on, uh, and are presumably one of the most gender equal states. Again, then I, I can refer to my minister's keynote and her insights. Still, at least I put a lot of trust in the thought, competencies and actions that ESD can bring. Uh, could you please develop on that and let education and sustainable development um, be, um, I mean, how can we, can, how can we create uh, ESD and gender equality as a framework? The, the floor is open. Who wants to comment on that? Maki, please, yes. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much, Eva, for the question. And, and I think um, maybe I won't be too, too focused, but I think, I think this session is very important for us too because um, the title of the, the panel is Synergies, Creating Synergies Between ESD and Gender. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is critical for me, in my, my view, that these two, ESD, the concept of ESD and gender equality, should not be really dealt separately. It's it's really something that has to be worked together because the advancement in, in one will be mutually reinforcing the other. Mm. And in a way, I would even go further that gender equality itself is really a prerequisite to, to advance ESD. Mm. And then ESD is also prerequisite to make sure gender equality is realized. So you can't really, really separate the two in reality. Of mm. course, in terms of our theoretical academic discussions, and we can say that in practice, it's much more difficult. And I think one of the reasons is because not necessarily because ESD is more of a complex, uh, it's certainly a complex concept, but it's, it's a bit easier to, to, to overcome because it can also directly relate to ESD from a, a very concrete issue in front of us, like climate change. 
However, gender equality also has a lot of you know, strong linkages to cultural values, social expectations, mm -hmm. and it is very much about attitude and behavior and a mindset change, and it becomes very difficult. However, both of them can nicely come together, create that synergy in an educational context. And I would say educational context because it doesn't have to be schools per se. It can be any learning opportunity provision that brings the knowledge and skill set together and to be able to make sure that the the, the conditions are being laid with certain policy and legal and, and whatever kind of condition that can be brought by equity uh, interventions, but then also creating an environment that would also value equally the differences in the, the attitude, behavior, and the diversity that is around. And, and, and this is quite critical, uh, but I think the importance is that we start to really make sure deliberately that we discuss about ESG and gender equality together rather than you talk about gender equality on one side and ESG on one side. And I have to admit that UNESCO has also been a little bit in that trend so until now. And I think it is really high time that we start to talk about it in, in a, a better integrity. That's a super good point. Thank you, Maki. Let's hear from the auditorium. I, I can follow up on that. Uh, so I would absolutely agree uh, with Maki that both are uh, mutually constitutive if uh, you can't have one without the other. And as I said, it's a claim about justice, about human rights. And that might be a very trivial, but a very far reaching point that uh, you can't distinguish uh, um, the, the claims a person has by, by birth uh, uh, and then put them in boxes of gender. That would be uh, extremely contradicting. So therefore, it is a, a, a high um, securement that comes with human rights and as I said that would be one subcategory of it. Um, in terms of the status quo, you were asking about that, uh, how do we um, diagnose uh, the, the current status of uh, gender equality. Um, I would say that uh, also um, referring to um, the, the cloud of words that has been um, uh, presented before, what are the, um, the reasons for, for, best, for inequality still, I would add one, which is um, uh, adaptive preferences. Uh, um, so you're, you're born and socialized into something that makes you a second a status uh, uh, second status category person by being a woman for example in certain countries and so those adaptive preferences that you that you kind of even reproduce that by educating your own children like that I think that cycle is can be broken by education and is being broken I think there is a waking up uh, uh, at the moment that is being induced by education and therefore uh, I see uh, lots of reasons for hope not just naive optimism but but critical hope that is aware of the hindrances that are there because, um, because of uh, a shift in social values in, um, and in um, something that the majority brings to, to mind and, and reinforces. And therefore, I think that, it, that there can be social tipping points also, not just tipping points in, in, in uh, for example, the climate system. And those social tipping points are uh, in, in so far being reached in, in many societies that there is no way back uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to those um, old vested interests, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. and, but there is also one thing that is, uh, um, I, I would really like to mention because I think always when people are striving for and struggling for more justice, there can be the danger of, let me call it, overdoing it. Or, you know, in the end, it's also a, an emotional thing. Uh, there is something that should be granted to a person, but you don't give it to him. So you, you get angry. And, and so there are lots of emotions involved in, in inequality and injustice. And those emotions can drive us also uh, to dogmatism and to putting things too much on uh, identity and ideology and thereby um, kind of, I think it would be 
uh, really a pity of thereby delegitimizing uh, that so important uh, gender equality if we are um, if some groups are becoming too angry and pointing then or you know we have that in-group out-group bias that's very common unfortunately that's inbuilt in us and we build groups and we belong to that group they belong to those group and i'm just uh, what i wanted to say is that we should be careful not then to from uh, women that have been victimized and so on then pointing to the old white men and so on and and creating new injustices by that that's something i really would like to stress yeah thank you so much i need to i want to just hear very shortly from nicholas also sorry for interrupting you very interesting nicholas do you have uh, something to add quite shortly because we have so little time left yeah, I, I think I think it would be interesting to, uh, as you said, how, how how where do we want to end up? And I think uh, that's a very good point to again emphasize how connected sustainable development, ESD, and um, gender equality are. Because uh, if we're in in a a more gender equal or let's say totally gender equal society, that would also have uh, other. Um, effects on our society which would be very beneficial so and that's that's also also uh, something which which has been looked at several times that um, more gender equal societies focus more on public health on safety um, on um, cli on uh, climate protection some, something like that so um, these are all 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 things that factor into each other. So, um, if we if we can can abolish abolish harmful stereotypes and uh, role models, um, and uh, work work towards a, a more gender equal society, that can really um, create a positive change for our whole society and uh, bring bring about a meaningful change for everybody. I think. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nicholas. Let's go to the Mentimeter one more time. Um, and be a bit swift with it, but I really would like to know what you as participants uh, think in relation to which achievements in the realm of gender equality provides particular hope for a more just future. Uh, again, the code is here, the other two ways of getting there is in the chat. Uh, and I hope to use your um, insights here in my conclusion uh, just now, very soon. We will have another word cloud uh, coming up here. Education, me too. Yeah. Gender science. I mean, it's really a positive that education is held forth by you participants, because that is the very, very topic. Well, education in general, but ESD in, in particular, is the very topic of this. Uh, yeah, shared parental leave, certainly, yes. Technology, better paid teachers, youth action. Um, let's see. Money, money, money. Um, we, we can keep this, uh, this image and keep the words coming here. And uh, there are, so we have a lot of achievements that actually bring hope. And, uh, and I also agree with the Swedish Minister of Higher Education and Research, Matilda. This conference uh, really can be a good opportunity to be, to be visionary and also a bit optimistic, actually. At least we who are gathered here are presumably here because of an urge in us to improve gender quality, equality and a hope that ESD can ca actually contribute to this. And let's continue then to think co-creatively co uh, about how we can achieve improvements really as soon as possible keeping in mind all of these um, words and um, concepts that you actually have put up here now for this all participants 
And with that, I want to thank all participants for sharing your views. Uh, a special thanks to our three panelists, Maki, Amche, and Nicholas, and of course, Madam Minister, Mr. Um, Mr. Ambassador, and uh, uh, finally, thanks to our co-organizers, the Embassy of Sweden in Berlin, Institute for Tour, and UPAN. Um, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for partake partaking in this. Uh, I have enjoyed this discussion immensely. Thanks. Bye-bye.